Today in this video, we're going to be going over the Dawnbreaker. This was a plus 11 that I did yesterday on stream, and I want to just talk through each pull that we did. Obviously, it's a fairly linear dungeon up until the first boss, and then after that, there's a little bit of kind of open-ended questioning when it comes to routing, so you can kind of freestyle a little bit. I know there are, I think, two routes to this dungeon, and they typically fall into like pre-11 and post-11 keys, but I'm going to break down everything that I've been kind of doing here. It's in, mostly in terms of like defensives and stuff. So first pull we're going to double. This is this is a pretty easy pull to double. There's like this one caster that's marked with a star. You just want to kick his shadow bolts or the night bolts or whatever they're called. Tormenting Ray, if it's on that player, they want to ideally use a defensive or at least the healer needs to heal them. And I'm going to start the pull off with like Dampen Harm into Weapons of Order. And that's pretty much it. Ideally, you're targeting the Ritualist here. They have, it's like kind of the beefier mini boss out of the bunch. They also do a little bit more group damage than everything else. The Curse Blades just hit the tank, and it's typically pretty chill. The You want to save a lot of your defenses for the trash on the ship, and the reason why is because now that the trash hits any harder, because they're ideally the or arguably the same exact mobs, but they, uh, they won't die as quickly because your DPS won't generally have cooldown since they use them all on this pack. The comp that we are running, obviously, is Fury Warrior Shadow Priest with an Aug Evoker. I don't know how that actually ended up playing out. I know that like Shadow Priest has like two minute CDs, but the Warrior has minute and a half. So I don't know if we were doing a minute and a half breath build or if we were running two, but maybe I'll have to ask QB about that. But anyways, this pack, because I don't have grips and uh, because we don't really have CDs, I don't want to chain this. Now, sometimes you'll what you'll see is you'll see groups do this pack plus the other one that you need to kill to start kind of the um, the next phase or to at least mount up to be able to go to the other ships. Without cooldowns though, uh, it is kind of a scary pull to do. We also have this Dark Emissary, or Void Emissary, where once you kill it, it gives you, I think, cooldown reduction plus healing increase. Brewmasters are really good at this because you can literally just touch of death it. In the 11s, it knocks off about 70% of the, the, the shield. Unless you pop, like, Fortifying Brew, uh, you can pretty much just instantly kill it. In lower keys, I think you, you unironically just one-shot it. Uh, they spawn roughly every minute and 10 seconds, so you can't touch of death every single one unless you have, like, some combat break. But you can pretty much do most of your damage, most of the damage to them. Sorry about the camera here, too. It, like, it like stutters for some reason whenever I'm on this boat. I'm not sure if that happens for everyone. And um, once that pack goes down, we're going to just mount up. Now, as you probably noticed throughout most of those pulls down there, I committed things like Diffuse, things like Fortifying Brew, uh, and Black Ox Brew. So that ship was pretty scary. This this is the scarier pack too, right after this. So I am sitting on Dampen Harm. I also just committed my Swarm Lord's Authority there from the Silken Court boss. The priority ideally is the Web Mage, but if you can kill a Shadow Mage quickly, that'll help reduce the amount of kicks your group will need to um, prevent damage on this pull. Curse Blades don't really do much, and honestly, this this dungeon, as it's probably known by now, is one of the easier dungeons out of the out of the pool. Mostly because there are a lot of things for some reason in this dungeon that don't scale, and I don't know if Blizzard will ever fix it or not. Anyways, we're just kind of vibing here. And there's not really much to talk about outside of like making sure you kick web bolts and spread out for the bursting cocoon. As long as you're not running a full melee group in here, generally this the mechanics in this dungeon are pretty easy. And we're going to fly right over to the next ship. Same thing here. We want to definitely focus the web mage. If we can, I'm going to set focus to it. But we also have a commander in this pull too, which will cause a little bit more tank damage. I do start off early with the fuse magic because I don't think some people just weren't really kicking. The abyssal howl does a good bit of uh, AoE damage. But I'm, if I'm not mistaken, it's one of the things that doesn't really scale um, with the dungeon modifier, which is really good. So you just generally don't take that much damage. As you can see, I'm like just topping healing, which isn't normal. In a lot of dungeons, the healer will always be beating the, the tank in healing, especially a brewmaster, but it's pretty chill. Right there, touch of death pretty much instantly vaporizes it. We do kick the howl, which is still good, and we just want to make sure we're locking down web bolts when we can. So now that this pull is down, we're ready to go back to the main ship. I think a lot of people don't respect this boss, or maybe don't know how it works, but the Obsidian Beam cast doesn't just spawn beams, but it does a ton of tank damage, so you need to mitigate every single time. So for the Brewmaster, that's very easy. We have things like Dampen, we have things like Diffuse, we have things like Celestial Brew that, that reduce the damage by a ton. So I started off early there with just a Celestial Brew, 
And now for the next one, I'll either have Dampen or Diffuse Magic, and then I can also pair it with a Celestial Brew. It happens once every like 30-ish seconds, so generally speaking with cooldown reduction, you should be able to get Celestial Brew for every single set. And I'm going to try to pull this boss away. It's a little obnoxious. This boss sometimes just doesn't want to move. I, I hate tanking this boss. It's not fun. But you want to stay away from these collapsing knights because they do grow over time and they normally prioritize range. So if you have two range in the group, that's preferred. Uh, luckily we do. We have Aug and Shadow Priest. I have Touch of Death here. I end up using it to kill it once it's at 50% health. I could have used it a little bit earlier, but I just didn't. Collapsing Knight comes out again. We're going to try to kite away. Now, ideally, the range would stay stacked here, but it's not really that big of a deal because once the, the second set of Collapsing Knight spawns, the first one will disappear like a second or two after. So it's really not that important. Obsidian Beam comes out. We have Dampen Harm there instead. And we're going to phase. You do want to respect this Darkness Comes cast a little bit more like you want to give it a little bit more breath than you than you than the visual looks because it can kill you so i generally try to keep it in like the lower left hand corner of my screen and as soon as it blows up then i dart back for the boss generally speaking one of the bolts will probably go off unless one of your dps can get back really 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 quickly but taking one bolt to the face while you're flying isn't going to be a big deal because you should be healthy as a tank at least obsidian beams coming out again i'm going to use fortifying brew to stop some of this damage and we're just going to be rotating. Essentially, the idea here for tanks is mitigate whenever Obsidian Beams comes out and make sure you have enough room for everyone to move around the boss, at least in melee. Range can generally stand further out and rotate with the beam just fine if the Collapsing Knights happen to be close, but you definitely want to try to keep it away. Obsidian Beams coming out once more. I'm actually Zen Metting there. I know Zen Med... It has been more popular because it just it ends up being better pathing. But Zen Med is good for some of these tank busters, and this is a great example. You also have the next boss being a great example whenever there's a terrifying slam. Uh, Zen Med's actually just really powerful. Maybe I'll do a guide at some point talking about all the times you can use Zen Med because it is a little finicky. Or it's very nuanced, I should say. And then on this Obsidian Beam, I used uh, Diffuse Magic if you didn't see that there. So Brewmaster is really strong for this fight because you pretty much have a defensive every single time. And the route that I like to do when you're doing 11s or lower is I like to go here. So I'm putting, I'm pinging, I'm putting down a bunch of world markers so people can see it. Um, there is also a strategy where you go behind the building. And the reason for that is because on the stairs, you're going to see these like little swirly void elemental dudes. They do a ton of unavoidable group damage at some point. And in a 12 and higher, like it's super deadly to have two of them in a pack. And you're forced to do two of them on the stairs. So I wouldn't recommend going in front unless you're doing um, 11s and lower. But I like this route a little bit better because it's just, I think it's easier to understand instead of flying around a bunch of buildings. I like to try, try to streamline my route when I'm running with pugs or in keys where um, you're not going to get one shot by accidentally or being forced to pull two mobs. So I do the kind of the two on the right hand side where we landed and then I bring them into this pack here. There's not a lot of group damage. You can even with a really good group, you can actually double this with the pack that's on the stairs if you have just a goaded healer um, or if you're very comfortable with the tank damage. I ended up running two 11s actually yesterday on stream. The second 11, we did double it up. It didn't go that well, but I did live. So right here, these, these shadow walkers aren't very scary, but these giant like manifested shadow guys are. All they do is they spawn swirls, but then they do a ton of like AOE damage. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, this, pulls, this pulls very tame. This is one of those dungeons, and actually every dungeon's like this. If you play the route clean... You pull a pack at a time, play the route clean. Everything's timeable. Okay, obviously, like, you need a decent DPS, but I see a lot of people try to, like, over-pull and over-complicate things. And when you do that, you risk wiping. And wiping is the most punishing part about keys right now. It's not really the timer. The timer only becomes punishing when you, it's just, like, when you die and when you have to constantly run back, when you lose 15 seconds per death. So right here, I'm pulling this one mob. I'm trying to get aggro on the Void Emissary, and then I'm going to get the Tank Buster, so I'm going to roll away. 
take it to the face, and we're chilling. Void Emissary is going to go down, and now I'm going to roll over and grab this pack. There is one Dark Caster. I want to kick it. Not because it does a lot of damage, but because I want it to group up with this uh, this uh, mini boss. And there's a patrol on the left-hand side that will eventually come back towards us, and I don't want anyone to accidentally pull it. So I want to try to get everything back to this purple world marker. Rolling away and then dashing back in is really nice if you're using lighter than air. You can counter the knockback very easily, and you're going to see me do the same thing on the second boss, and I'll point it out. But again, this, this pack's very tame. There's, again, nothing really to do. If you want to, like, set focus to the Dark Caster and make sure you're kicking it, that's great. Not, it's not really that big of a deal. I'm going to roll down the hill, and that's it. Then I'm going to dash back up, keep it nice and easy. And this guy will eventually go down. Fast forwarding a little bit here. Once that mini boss dies, I actually, I don't fly down. I just roll down here. <laughs> I'm putting down markers, I'm pinging, I want to make sure my group knows where to go. A lot of people try to land up top. I think it's just better to land down here and get these pulls started. There's two casters on the left-hand side. Getting this pack started first is, I just ultimately think is better. I place on a Black Ox Etchie to help with threat, though I don't have AoE taunt for a couple seconds. And then once this pack starts taking some damage, you can definitely pull in the mobs up top. Again, I just, I think it's better to play down here than it is to play up top. Especially when you're playing in a pug group and you're not coordinated with your flying or your movement. Like, if the tank lands in and no one comes down for a couple seconds and then the tank just dies, like, it's obviously going to cause issues. Or if a DPS lands first and accidentally pulls other mobs or pulls this pack, which I've had happen a ton of times in Dawnbreaker. You need the percent anyways, so you might as well pull it. And these, these mobs aren't too difficult. The tacticians do a lot of tank damage and they do these frontals, but again, there's nothing really on the group outside of the mini boss. So if your group is coordinated, you can definitely land down here or land up top and kind of pull things in. I just prefer landing here and, and taking it one pack at a time. It's not that tight of a key. So I'm being wary of where my group is positioned. I see the Aug and the Shadow Priest behind the group, so I'm trying to aim these Black Edge Frontals away. And then the only thing really to note here is that this mini boss does a lot of AoE pulsing group damage. I haven't attempted this in a 12 yet. I'd imagine that it's pretty scary. But in an 11, I, I don't find it that painful. And honestly, this, this Holy Paladin did a great job keeping everyone up. This was a pretty clean run. I think at the end, I think we only ended up having one or two deaths, maybe? I don't even remember when the deaths would have occurred. So this emissary spawned right at the end of the pole. This is actually really good. It sucks that we can't fly away right away, but killing this and then getting cooldown reduction while we're flying is probably like the best thing that could happen. Oh, I remember this. So we accidentally pulled a web mage, and I don't know how. I think it was a shadow priest. I don't know if it was like his his mob or if he tab targeted or or what, but basically this thing got pulled on accident at the very end. So now we're just single targeting it down. There's not a lot of mobs around here that I can pull with it. And I also want room in the second boss arena or area that I don't want to like start fucking up the route too much. So this isn't part of the normal route. I actually end up pulling a different web mage if I feel like I need to later on, but we'll uh we'll skip ahead here. So once this area is down, oh, that's what happened. Okay, I was it was funny because I was on stream and I was like, why the fuck is my group taking so long? And it's because they were killing that emissary back there, and I, I didn't realize that it spawned. So you would pull this web mage, you see, this malician. Uh, you can clear this mob to make it easier or, or less sketchy for your group. What I'm going to do is I'm going to actually pull this group first, kick the night bolt, and then once I have them in position, I'm going to tag the mini boss to bring it over here. Generally, I like, to, I like to wait for the first frontal to go off, so it doesn't end up going at my group. And then it also staggers it in a nice fashion, so it never overlaps with the orb. I put down an X world marker. This is where I expect players to stand if they get targeted by Dark Orb. You either want to send the orb down either of the paths, it, then it won't connect. If I pull him to X, you can also send it into like the barracks forge area, but I don't think players typically realize that. Um, so you can see though, our, uh, our range are standing right near X so they can bait it properly. Since I it looked like we were 
pretty good. It went on our Shadow Priest this time, it looks like. Um, I started moving the, the mini boss actually back towards kind of like the center fountain area because I wanted to give them more room to dodge the militia. And it looks like they were going to go that way anyways, so. This is probably the hardest mini boss. I, I haven't watched a lot of other players do this. I don't know if people pull it elsewhere, but I found that this spot works the best. But every time I pug this dungeon, no one knows what to do. And I wipe here. I get farmed in this spot when I'm pugging, which is obnoxious. I mean, this is a pug, but. So right here, we're going to actually do a pretty big pull. I don't think a lot of these mobs scale with the dungeon level. So I'm ringing it. I see the patrol is next to the other group of dark casters. So I'm going to roll in. And now we're just big old piss vibing, as the kids say. This pull looks super hectic. There's going to be a lot of casts going off, but know that the tormenting beams, unless there are like four of them are targeting one player, they're not going to, it's not going to be that lethal. The main thing you want to stop to make the pull go quicker is the umbral barriers. They put like a fairly sizable absorb, but you can see like there's four of those beams all targeting me and I'm barely taking damage. I don't know if Blizzard is ever going to fix this or adjust it. I feel like it's almost too late now to for them to fix it or to buff it. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know what they're going to do with this. And, uh, then we get an emissary just in time. So now we're going to do one more pull. We are going to be a little over count. I'm going to drop a statue in. It's going to kind of pull them all together. And then I'm going to ring a piece, I think. No, I don't. It's actually, it's on cooldown. Oh, there it is. I'm going to ring a piece them in just to get them nice and stacked. There's a lot of casters in here. Uh, ideally you're, for, you're targeting the tactician. Two reasons. They, they tend to have more health. Uh, and they do big tank damage. You want to make sure you're kicking the Emerald Barrier, but outside of that, everything else is kind of chill in this pool. I guess Night Bolts do hurt. Yeah, definitely kick Night Bolts. And uh, that's pretty much it. Oh, we, we lose our Paladin here. I think he just got Night Bolted to death. But it, it's it's going to end up being fine. The Warriors got Spell Reflect. He's popping in Rage Regen. I'm fine. There's not a lot of tank damage in this pull outside of the Tactician, but I feel comfortable tanking it. Um, and that's it. So one one little minor death there, and it's kind of like an oopsie on kicks. I think the Paladin had his kick available, but he was just getting Nightbolt slammed. And honestly, I think I probably kicked a Tormenting Beam. Once again, this is really good. We're going to get a little bit of cooldown reduction going into this boss. This doesn't really matter for anything. We just want to pull quickly so we can actually send cooldowns. Black Edge is going off, and then we're going to roll in. I do want the healer to drink a little bit here, I think. Just because I... This is this is still an intense healer fight, especially when Tyrannical and Fortified are in play. Uh, I put down a blue marker, and this is where I ideally want the group to stand. Real, realistically, you can send the orb in, like, two or three different directions. I'm putting down the green world marker for people to not be near it, uh, ideally. Because what I'm going to do is whenever this terrifying slime comes off, I'm going to roll backwards. Oops, I actually fucked that one up. Uh, you roll backwards, you pop a defensive, and then right when the knock goes off, you dash forward, and it counters it. I do need to update my tick tracker for this Shadow Decay, which I'll have to do after this, uh, <laughs> this commentary. And then one other thing that I did is that I put down a black ox statue underneath the, the boss. So whenever these little, like, little shadow guys spawn, the little shadow blobs, I can then AoE taunt to make sure that they all come to me, and then I can go into, like, things like exploding keg or just big keg smash damage. So right here, rolling backwards, dampen harm, dash forward. Boss stays in the same position. The melee have full uptime, aka the, the I guess, two melee. It's our paladin or warrior. And then we'll all be nice and stacked. Now, there is a, I, supposedly, I haven't done it personally because I just think it's stupid, <laughs> but there's a spot in the fountain that you can stand where you don't get knocked back, but the problem with doing that is that then all of your melee have to run out away from the boss to stop doing damage for a second while the terrifying slam is going off. I think if a tank can roll out and counter the knockback and live, there's no reason to like do kind of weird strats like that. Brewmaster obviously is very good for this fight. We have an AoE taunt, we have really big AoE damage. We can counter knockbacks, and we pretty much have a defensive for every single one. We'll almost always have Celestial Brew, and then we have, like, Dampen, Diffuse, Fort, and Black Axe Brew, and Zen Med for all of them. Every once in a while, you'll see me kind of throwing out a free Vivify on a, on a target that looks a little low. Right here, roll back, pop Celestial Brew, dash forward. Every single time. 
and then more animate shadows. Once they all spawn, you're going to see that I'm going to AoE taunt here. They're all going to have the provoke over their frames. And uh, now we have an emissary to kill. And that's pretty much it. This, this boss is really rinse and repeat. It does change the sequencing of spells because they all have different timers. Um, so sometimes it's like slam into orb into adds to damage. Sometimes it's like group damage into orb into slam into... I Yeah, it changes like every single set. The boss timers are consistent like every time you run this place. But like the fourth damage set like overlapping with like a terrifying slam or something that like occasionally happens. Uh, time for the worst mini boss in the game. I hate this mini boss with a burning passion. I pulled him all the way over here thinking that maybe he'll spawn adds near him away from the boss, but he's actually going to spawn adds really, really, really far away, which is obnoxious. The tormenting eruption does a lot of damage. If it's on you, use a defensive. I threw out a free, like I threw out one of my free vivifies on our, our holy paladin there. It's one of those things where it, like it may counter one tick, but it's not going to like maybe save someone, but it's worth doing because it, it end up might that just enough HPS that goes into a target. I feel like this guy spawns different ads every time I'm in here. I, maybe they are the same. I honestly haven't paid attention enough, but sometimes it's a bunch of casters. Sometimes it's like all melee guys. Sometimes it's like a mixture. Like right here, we're seeing two dark casters and I think, and a shadow mage. So it's like triple caster and it's, it's just like annoying to get them all grouped up. You also have the tormenting uh, eruption going off. So players have to be spread out. So you have this random kind of group damage. I'm sending another vivify in our paladin. There isn't a lot of tank damage here unless you have the tormenting beam on you, but even when you do, it's like not crazy, or the tormenting eruption. It's just really difficult to get everything grouped up, and this is exactly why uh, Frost Death Knights are meta. <laughs> so our evoker went down. If you ever die on the ship when you're doing this mini boss, just release. The release is literally on the ship. And then we're going to finish this off. Unfortunately, these guys don't give percent, but we're already, we're, we ended up going over by like three or four percent, which isn't a big deal. It's because we pulled that extra web mage. And once our healer is good, we're going to pull. So we're going into this boss with like, what, seven-ish minutes left? A little less than eight minutes. So as long as we don't wipe, we're going to be absolutely fine. There isn't much for a tank to do on this fight, if I'm being honest. There isn't really a tank buster. You can't leave to help with barrels, which really sucks. There's a small window when you technically can whenever he's casting the Erosive Spray, but you never want to risk it, because if he finishes the cast and you're out of melee range, he's instantly going to wipe your group, so it's just, it's never worth. Basically, it's a DPS's job to uh, <laughs> to kill this kind of stuff. Also, um, got a good bit of followers last night on the stream, so I appreciate everyone who followed me. I've been pretty inconsistent about my streaming, but I do plan on getting back into it here. Uh, but yeah, anyways, we just, we kind of just take damage to the face. Um, I'm going to ideally try to like use Vivify when I can to keep people alive because there isn't a lot of tank damage. For some reason too, the Erosive Spray on the ship feels worse than a sp uh, Erosive Spray when you're down downstairs in phase two. But once you throw six barrels, you're good to go. I believe he always phases at 64%, but I might be wrong. I, I've heard different reports where you can actually push him lower and phase one damage does matter, but I, I haven't ever found that to be the case. Whenever I end up doing this fight, it always seems like you need to get him to like the 60, the 64, and then he just phases. And generally that'll happen based off of barrels. I'm going to place a transcendence and then I'm going to place a black ox statue. There isn't a reason why I place black ox statue. I just like placing it down. Uh, I was hoping that possibly he would actually target the statue with the spray or the the webbing but that's not the case he i don't think i've ever seen him target it there's a couple of inner weird inner interesting boss interactions where boss mechanics do target pets or totems and when you're able to place on a black ox statue kind of out of the way it's super nice we're going to kick this eruption right before it goes off just to milk a little bit of damage and we're basically continuing phase one mechanics without the pesky having to run off for bombs but we do have players getting webbed now notice where i'm standing the reason I stand out here is to bait the um, the webs away from our group. I, I honestly think melee should generally stand out here. Now, there's an argument to be made. It's like, oh, well, you want to stay stacked for healers. But these swirls will sometimes, they target random players and they can target the tank. So if the tank is off to the side, uh, there's a chance where you don't have to dodge the, the webs at all. 
because it'll they'll target the tank. So I generally just alternate sides. It's not too big of a deal. And uh, yeah, th this fight is pretty much rinse and repeat. You either you kill it or it kills you. And when it kills you, it's because the healer the healer either fucked up or ran out of mana. And as you can see there, the webs actually just went off to the right hand side. So the there's less or there's more room for the the DPS players to to dodge. All right, and that's uh, <laughs> I mean that's it. That's that's the dungeon. Good bit of group damage here. I would say if you're going to use defensives, use Celestia Brew and like Diffuse Magic whenever you're getting hit by the Erosive Spray, and then you can off-heal your group with Vivify. Even if you have to hard cast Vivify, it's not actually that bad of a heal. Obviously, it's not great. You obviously should be doing damage to help push the boss faster, but if your Vivify healing will help uh, one of your group members, specifically your healer, stay alive through the Erosive Spray damage, that's better than opting in not to heal. And then if you wipe, you wipe, you know, he's burnt at that point. I don't have touch for this emissary, so we're going to just kill it raw. We're going to get some cool introduction and increased healing. This affix is amazing for this fight in particular because um, we have the increased healing and now we're about to get the erosive spray right after the spinneret strands. So it should overlap quite nicely here to keep everyone topped. Maybe I'm crazy. Maybe it's not. Maybe DBM's lying to me. But generally like a good effects, like the cooldown reduction is great. It's going to give the paladin more cooldowns. It's going to give the DPS more defensives and more offensives. And I guess like I'll quickly talk about my talent build. Um, there's nothing too crazy that I'm running, though. The one thing that I've noticed that a lot of people have made the swap to is a lot of people are running Scalding Brew. I don't like Scalding Brew. I don't like the playstyle with it. I find it generally does less damage in single target too, which I think single target damage is just as important. Uh, also, I've been playing with Salsabim Strength for the last, I don't know, two and a half, three years. So for me, it's like a mental thing where I'd rather play with the thing that I'm comfortable with, even though that the performance might be a little lower in terms of overall damage. But I find that si your overall AoE is going to be lower, your overall single target is going to be higher. I don't know if that's going to change in 11.0.5 because Spinning Crane Kick will start counting towards Flurry Strike charges and or Flurry Strike procs, like spending the energy which might make Scalding Brew, or not Scalding Brew, uh, Salsabim Strength a little bit better because you have more uptime on Shard Passions and that means you can spam Spinning Crane Kick. I don't really know. The other thing I'm running, I think I'm running Light Brewing versus uh, Training of Nizao just because, again, I, I, it's hard for me to trust healers when pugging. So, but yeah, uh, good run. It was, you know, three and a half minutes left on the timer. Definitely could have been a little bit more aggressive with my pulls, but again, playing it safe means you time keys as long as you don't make any crazy mistakes. So I hope... Uh, that all makes sense. I, let me know if you have any questions down below. Here's my talents at the very end. Someone actually asked. And, uh, yeah. Th big shout out to my Patreon supporters, because without you guys, I wouldn't be able to do content like this. I hope you're all staying happy, healthy, and I'll catch you all in the next one. Peace.